Starting, we're going to open UniHub, ensuring that it's version 3.2. If you are new to Unity, a download link to UniHub is available in the description below. First, we're going to click New Project. From here, we're going to ensure that the editor version is 2021.3 LTS. And then we're going to select 2D from the template list. We're going to name our project and simply click create project. Now that we have our project, click window in the top menu, selecting package manager, go heading over to packages in project and selecting unity registry. You're going to navigate down to input system and click install. Clicking yes, so Uni can do its thing. Time for a bit of coding. Right click in our project window, heading over to create and click C sharp script. From there, we're going to rename the script to game manager. We're going to open it. From here, create a static variable called public static game manager instance. This is so we can use the game manager anywhere in the scene via its instance. Next, Remove the update method and rename start to awake. This is so we can create a condition that checks if there's already an instance of game manager. If one does exist, then this duplicate will just destroy itself. Coming back to Unity, we want to import our sprite sheet. I left a link to the default sprite sheet in the description. And once imported, select it in the project window within the assets folder. From there, we're going to head over to the inspector and do the following. We're going to set sprite mode to multiple, pixels per unit to 10, filter mode to points, its max size to 512, and compression to high quality. We're going to then click apply and proceed over to sprite editor. Here, we're going to go to slice in its top menu change its type to grid by cell size and change the pixel sizes for X and Y to 10. Click slice and click apply and then close the sprite editor window. Next, select the main camera game object within the hierarchy and then in the inspector, simply set the size on the camera component to 10. This way, we have a better view of our soon to be roguelike map. Finally, while we are done, we can still get a bit of street cred. So let's turn our project into a repository and publish it on GitHub. I'll leave a link to a previous video I created on that subject. So simply put, open GitHub desktop, click file, new repository. We're now going to name our repository, give it a short description, select the folder where it's located, and in the git ignore list, we're going to select Unity. Then click create repository before finally clicking publish repository. It's time to begin our first steps into creating our roguelike. But before that, let's take some time to sort our assets into folders by creating a resources folder and a scripts folder. Then drag the sprite sheet into resources and game manager into scripts. Now open the resources folder, expand the sprite sheet and drag the at symbol into the hierarchy. This creates a 2D game object that we can then rename to player. Before dragging into our resources folder where it becomes a prefab. Now delete the sprite from our hierarchy and open the game manager script in our scripts folder. With our game manager open, we're going to create a start method. We will then pass in instantiate resource.load with its type being game object and parameter being the player string. This will make our player game object using the player prefab located within the resources folder. Once we click play in the Unity editor. We will then add a dot name equals player. So we don't see clone within its name in the hierarchy. From here, we will be creating a simple turn handler by first creating two new variables, a float called time, giving it a default value of 0.1F, followed by a Boolean called is player turn with a default value of true. 
before finally allowing our player is turn boolean to be accessed through a getter. Next, we will create two methods, one called end turn and the other wait for turns. The end turn method tells the game manager to set its player turn to false and start a coroutine called wait for turns. The wait for turns method, due to being of type I enumerator, tells the game manager to wait one tenth of a second before setting its player turn to true. With our game manager now configured, head back to Unity Editor and create an input action file called controls. We're going to set generate C sharp class to true, followed by clicking apply. Now press edit asset. Create a control scheme called arrow keys and add keyboard and mouse to the list. You can set mouse to optional and then click save. You will follow this by creating an action map called player Rename new action to movement. Set its action type to value, followed by setting its control type to vector2. From here, we're going to quickly add the interaction press and a normalized vector2 in its processes. Now expanding movement, we're going to delete its current binding and add an up, down, left, right composite. We're now going to set its individual paths to the arrow keys. Before moving on, we're going to create a new action called exit and set its binding to escape, making sure to set arrow keys to true and saving the asset. Now to use the input system that we just created, we're going to create a player script. Opening the script, with the script open, we're going to get rid of the unneeded imports followed by adding in Unity Engine dot input system, and then remove both the start and update methods. Here we're gonna add a reference to our controls input actions, and then a private Boolean to represent when we hold down a movement key. Next, we're going to add the awake method to create a new controls object followed by adding the on enable and on disable methods. These two methods tell the controls when they can be used and when they cannot be used. It also handles the subscriptions to and from the controls input actions. We will then proceed to add the methods called on movement and on exit. These methods take in the context provided when the movement keys are used or the escape key we have on the movement method. When the context is started, i.e. when you hold down a key to move, move key held boolean will be set to true. And when you cease holding onto the key, it will then say context.cancelled, which will then set the boolean to false. With our on exit method, unlike in the tcod tutorial, all I've put here is debug.log exit. This can be changed to application.quit when you proceed to build your roguelike with our input actions being handled, we're going to also create two more methods that are called fixed update and move player. The fixed update method has a condition that checks to see if is player turned in the game manager instance is set to true and also checks if the movement key is being held. We will then call move player with move player just being a simple transform.position taking in our value from the vector2 in our movement action. Upon movement, it will also call end turn in our game manager instance. Now head back to the Unity editor. Here, we're going to go back to the resources folder. Selecting our player prefab, we're going to then add the player script by clicking add components, typing in player and selecting it. From here, we're going to create a new game object, call it game manager, and add the game manager script to it. I'm going to quickly change the background color for the main camera to black. And let's press play to test out our movement. 
everything seems to be in order. It's time to create an entity class. Um, this class is gonna be used to represent players, enemies, items, and whatever else. So in the project asset script folder, we're going to create an entity script. Open it up. First up, remove the unnecessary imports, followed by the update method. Next, we're gonna add in a private Boolean for is sentient, along with its getter. The reason being, this is to indicate if something is alive or not. We're then gonna add in two conditions. These conditions first check if it is the player or not, otherwise it checks if it's sentient. These conditions will be handling the placement of our entities, whether or not it's gonna be placed at the start or added onto the entity list. After the start method, we're gonna implement a move method where the move parameter will take in a direction and with that direction, it will tell the game object what position it's going to be in. From here, we're gonna create an action class and do the following. Input using Unity Engine, static public class action, followed by implementing three methods. A static public void escape action, a static public void movement action, taking an entity and direction, and a static public void skip action. The actions are quite simple. One simply prints a log saying quit in the console. The movement action uses ent.move method, taking in the direction given to it, followed by ending the turn of the game manager. And finally, for the skip action, it simply just ends the turn. Now head on over to the game manager. Here we're gonna add an integer called entity num, followed by a list with type entity and giving it a variable name of entities and initializing it. We're going to next rename start to start turn remove the instantiation, and add the following conditions. If entities with entity num get component player, then is player turn equals true. This simplifies that the turn is now the player's. Else if entities entity num is sentient, this will call the skip action as we don't have AI logic yet. Now heading down to the end turn method, we're going to exchange these codes with a set of conditions. Once again, checking if the entity's entity num is the player, it's going to set is player turn to false. It will then check to see if entity num equals entities.count minus one, changing it to zero. Else, it will simply just increment it before starting a coroutine called turn delay, which is simply the wait for turns method just renamed. Remove the is player turn equals true from turn delay before adding the start turn method. This is followed by adding two simple methods that you've actually seen earlier within the entity class. Those two being add entity and insert entity. These are relatively simple. Add entity is simply adding an entity to the entities list and insert entity is just adding the entity wherever we specified the index. In this case, it's going to be zero. As if I code, we always want the player to start first. I'm just gonna quickly repurpose our player prefab. So heading over to the resources folder, drag player back into the hierarchy, right click it, go to prefab, and unpack it completely, followed by renaming it to NPC. Next, get rid of the player component script within it, and add the entity script, making sure the check is sentient and change the color to yellow within the sprite render before dragging it into the resources folder. Now left click player and adding the entity script also to the player prefab. Once again, checking is sentient and then get rid of the NPC game object within the hierarchy. While we're still at the hierarchy, right click and create a toll map. Rename it to floor map. Control C and Control V to duplicate it before renaming the duplicated toll map to obstacle map. Heading over to grid and renaming it to map manager. From here, click on window within the top menu, going down to 2D and selecting tile palette. Here we're going to create a new palette called traditional roguelike before selecting Curate. Create a folder called Palette and clicking Select Folder. Now from the sprite sheet, we're going to get the hash symbol and the full stop, dragging them into the Tile Palette. Selecting Palette and Select Folder. 
This process creates two tiles for us to use, as we can see within the palette folder. Now head on to the scripts folder, where we're going to create a script called Map Manager. Now we're simply going to drag it onto the Map Manager game object within the hierarchy before opening it up. As always, remove the unnecessary imports and the update method. Now I'm going to change the flow up a little bit and do the following. Now I'm going to add in an instance for the map manager, followed by two private int variables that control both the width and height of the map. Two color variables. These will have a purpose later on. And then our two created tiles, followed by the tile maps that we created and giving access to them with their own getter methods. Now import unity.tilemaps to get rid of the squiggly lines. Before just like the game manager, creating an awake method that controls the instance. Now in the start method, I'm just gonna add a little bit of code. Now it is a little bit to take in, so I'll explain it step by step. We're getting a vector three center tile from halving both the width and height of the map. We're creating a box with the bounds int wall bounds, telling it it's going to start from the 29th X position and the 28th Y position. It's going to continue right three tiles before stopping. I've then added two simple for loops that will set every single tile within wall bounds to the wall tile. And then like in the game manager, I'll be instantiating both the player and the NPC prefabs. You can ignore camera.main.transform.position and camera.main.orthographic size as it's just something I've done that's just a little bit of a sweet spot for viewing our roguelike. And before finishing off the map manager, we're going to add in a boolean method called inbounds that we'll be using to stop the player from leaving the game map. Heading back into the Uni editor, close the tile palette before selecting the map manager. Heading over to inspector, we're going to set the tiles and the maps. With our map manager now set up, we're going to open the player script. Now I was informed on a Reddit post that I should make a simpler way of using the input system. That way being using set callback. And to implement it, we're going to do the following. Adding controls.iPlayerActions after mono behavior. From here, we're going to get rid of our movement and exit subscriptions. Followed by tweaking on movement and on exit. Within these methods, it's basically the same as before with on movement still having the same conditions. But now our on exit method uses a condition that checks if escape has been pressed, followed by calling the escape action within our action class. Speaking of our action class, we're going to go ahead and change around the move player method. Like before, we'll be taking in the read value for the vector two from the movement, but now it's also going to round the direction. This is due to the fact that when the player will go diagonal, it would actually be 0.71, which is not the intended outcome. So by rounding the number, it goes to the nearest one. We then create a future position using the transform dot position plus our rounded direction, and then calling the is valid position. This is a method that takes in the future position, uses our floor map to convert it to world cell, which is a vector three int. We use this vector three int to do the following. We first check if it's not in bounds for the map manager using the map manager in bounds method, followed by checking if the obstacle map has a tile on that position. We're also checking if the future position is also the current transform position. If any of these conditions are met, it will return false, stating that no, it is not a valid position. Otherwise, it returns true. If it does return true, then the action.movement action is called, passing in the game object, which is the player, and also the rounded direction. Once again, heading back to the Unity editor, we're going to go back into the resources folder and select both the NPC and player prefabs before changing their order and layer to one. Now testing what we've done. Everything seems to be in order. Before we continue, we will sort our scripts into two folders. The entity folder containing all our entity related scripts and the map folder, which will include both our map manager and new scripts, procgen and rectangular room. Open the procgen script. And we'll start by changing our class from public to sealed as it should never be inherited. 
Now remove both the start and update methods before creating a public void method called generate dungeon. This method will take in six variables within its parameters, those being map width, map height, room max size, room min size, max room, and a list containing our rectangular rooms. Before proceeding, we haven't set up our rectangular room class yet, so let's do that now. Accessing it from the primary sidebar, we are going to remove the mono behavior inheritance and generic methods, followed by giving it four public variables. These public variables being integers, they're going to consist of public int x, public int y, public int width, and public int height. x and y are the room's starting coordinates, and width and height are self-explanatory. We will then proceed to create a constructor taking in all the variables. We can now create three helper methods called center, get bounds, and get bounds int. The center method returns the centermost point of the room, and the get bounds and get bounds int methods return the area of the room, but for different reasons. I'll explain soon. But for now, we are adding a system serializable in square brackets above the class name before returning to procgen. We can now start generating our rooms, so create a for loop that sets a local variable called room num, its condition being while room num is less than room max, and if it's less, then increment. We can now establish our room size and coordinates, and create the room. Our issue now is since we're randomly smashing our rooms onto the map, we're going to run into rooms overlapping, and we don't want that now. So heading back to our rectangular room class, we are going to add a new method that returns a boolean called overlaps. This method will take in a list of rectangular room. It's pretty simple. We are using a for each to cycle through all the other rooms, checking if the area of the new room intersects with another room's area. If it does, it then returns true, else it return false. Now save and go back to procgen and add an if statement that uses our new method. This if statement will have a condition that checks if the room overlaps with another, and if it does, it will then continue to skip using it. All right, with that out of the way, time to dig out our rooms. Here, we create a for loop that handles the room's width before nesting another for loop to take the room's height. We then create an if statement that looks for the room's boundaries to build our walls. I've decided to make a boolean method called set wall tile if empty that checks using a vector3 int given if there is a floor tile on the floor map within those coordinates. It will return true, which skips placing a wall down with continue, otherwise it will place a wall. However, if it isn't a boundary coordinate, it will remove a wall tile on that position, if there is one, before placing a floor tile down. With our room created, add a statement that checks if it's the first room created, calling the create player method for map manager, passing in our new room's center. Before finally adding rooms.add new room. You might be confused about the create player method, and that's okay. We are heading over to map manager to rectify your confusion. Before we address this, let's change our code to be more in line with what we just did. We also want to make it look more readable in the editor. Start off by separating our variables and giving them meaningful headers. You will notice that included are the variables room max size, room min size, and max rooms that are being used to create our dungeon. Ensure to include list rectangular room rooms and a getter method to access it before finally also including two getter methods for our tiles. In the start method, we're going to remove our test code up until our MPC instantiate. Before adding in, what's happening here is that it's going to create an instance of procgen before calling its generate dungeon method. To do what we came here for, create a new void method called create player, which takes in a vector two position. Within it, we are just placing in our player instantiate that's been refactored to use the vector two position parameter. Before going back to procgen, we're going to quickly import system.collections.generic. If you decided to go back to the uni editor and press play, you would have found many rooms but with no way to move between them. So let's solve this issue 
by creating a new void method called tunnel between, its parameters being two rectangular rooms representing both the old room and the new room. We will make three vector two int variables, two to get the centermost coordinates of the rooms, and one to represent the corner of the tunnel. As we will be using the Brees and Ham line algorithm to generate an L-shaped tunnel, we will create an if statement with its condition being random.value less than 0.5, which is basically a coin flip for deciding if the tunnel starts horizontally or vertically. Now introduce a new list vector to int called tunnel chords, initialize it, and call the Brees and Ham line method twice. The first passing in the old room center, tunnel corner, and then tunnel chords. The second passing in the tunnel corner, new room center, then tunnel chords. What's happening is that the first call creates a line of points from the old room center to the tunnel corner, which are then stored in the tunnel chords list. The second call does the same process but starts on the tunnel corner before ending on the new room center. Let's create the method quickly. I won't be explaining exactly what happens, so I'll leave that to the comment section and a few links in the description. With that, proceed back to the tunnel between method, where we will create a for loop which iterates using the tunnel chords count, and then create an if statement to remove a wall tile if it exists in that coordinate. It will then add a floor tile, before surrounding that tile with walls using a nested for loop along with the set wall tile if empty method, which is basically a repeat of how we built the wall tiles for our rooms. Move back to the generate dungeon method and add an else after the if statement that created our player, within which we will contain the dungeon between method, which takes in the old room, then the new room. We can now test out the fruits of our labor and laugh. We will import our new fog sprite and two scripts, add a mill visibility and visibility for our field of view. Links down below in the description. Once imported, move the fog sprite to the resources folder and the scripts to the scripts folder. Open our resources folder and add the fog sprite to our traditional roguelike palette by repeating the steps from part two, giving us a new fog tile asset to work with. Now opening the scripts folder, we will create two new scripts, tile data to store our state information, and Brees and Ham line, the reason behind why, soon. Create a folder called algorithms, and place Adam Mill visibility, visibility, and Brees and Ham line into it before opening tile data. With tile data open, remove mono behavior and the start and update methods. Add two Boolean variables called is explored and is visible. Followed by adding a system.serializable within square brackets so we can see the class in the inspector. And head over to procgen. Starting from the top, I noticed a few unnecessary references to Map Manager in lines 52 and 60, as we already passed in the lists of rooms to be used in our generate dungeon method, so change them to use that instead. Next, copy lines 43 to 47 before scrolling down to set wall tile if empty. We will then create a private void method called setFloorTile, which takes in a vector3 int named pos, and paste our code into it, before exchanging our new vector3 int for pos, doing the same for our setWallTile with empty method, just to be consistent. Now let's implement our new method, changing lines 43 to 47 to set floor tile new vector 3 int passing in x and y. And then changing lines 91 to 97 to set floor tile new vector 3 and passing in the tunnel coordinates.
You may have noticed me removing zeros. This is due to there being no requirement for it when creating new vector 3 ints. Finally, add a dot compute to our Brees and Ham line calls before cutting the entirety of our Brees and Ham line method and opening the Brees and Ham line class. Removing the mono behavior and the start and update methods, add static to our class declaration. Now paste in the code we cut and do the following. Add static to the methods declaration, change private to public, its name to compute, then change its parameters to start, end, and coords using change all occurrences. I hope you all have been saving because now we're going to make a short stop at Game Manager. Here we're just going to add a getter method for our entities list before moving to Map Manager. Remove the colors due to a last minute decision on my part. Then add a tile base called Fog Tile and tile map called Fog Map. These will be used for our fog of war for adding a new list of type vector 3 int called visible tiles and initialize it. We will also create a dictionary called tiles, its key being vector 3 int for the tile position and value being tile data initialize it for making a getter method for our new fog map. Scrolling down, we're now going to introduce four methods. Update fog map. This method is pretty straightforward. It takes in the player's field of view. It proceeds to use a for each, cycling each position in visible tiles, setting a tiles is explored boolean to true using an if statement with a condition checking if it hasn't been explored. It then sets the is visible boolean to false before setting the position of that tile on the fog map to technically gray due to reducing its alpha in half. It then clears the visible tiles list before using another for each that cycles through the player's field of view, set the tiles is visible booleans to true, their color to clear and add it to the visible tiles list. The set entities visibilities method uses a for each that cycles through the game manager's entities list skipping the player to convert each entity's vector 3 transform position to a vector 3 int. It then uses that vector 3 int to see if it matches any of the visible tiles positions. If it does, then that entity's sprite renderer component is enabled, else it will be disabled. The last two methods are just helper methods. Add tile map to dictionary takes in our tile maps to add entries to our tiles dictionary and set up fog map adds a tile to each position using the tiles dictionary's keys. With our methods created, add three calls to our start method after our proc gen call. To add tile map to dictionary for our floor and obstacle tiles, and one calling our setup fog map method. Now head over to our entity class and give it three new variables. The first explains itself, the second is our list containing the tile positions the entity can see, and the third is used to create an instance of add the mill visibility. In our start method, we're going to change how we add our entity to our game manager entities list. Before adding, What's happening is that we are initializing field of view, creating an instance of other mill visibility, and then calling update field of view, a public method that gets the vector 3 int grid position of the entity and clears its field of view list before calling the compute method in Adam Mill's visibility algorithm. If you want to know exactly what is happening, you can check out the class's comments or check the link in the description referencing Adam Mill if you decide to delve further. The update field of view method then uses an if statement to check whether the entity's game object has a player script attached. If it does, a call to map manager's update fog map is made, passing in the entity's field of view before calling set entities visibility. Make sure that systems.collections.generic is imported and move over to action class. Add entity.update field of view to our movement action. Save and open the Unity editor. Duplicate our obstacle map. Rename it to fog map. And give it a new sorting layer of fog. Going into our map manager and setting our fog tile and fog map. 
Then go into the resources folder, click NPC, and disable its sprite renderer component. Now press play. It's time to start adding entities other than our player and a single NPC. So opening our entity script, add a new blocks movement boolean, followed by a getter method referencing it. Save the script and proceed to game manager. Here, we're going to create a public entity called get blocking entity at location method that takes in a vector three location. We will then use a for each to cycle through the entities list, checking using an if statement that an entity from the list has its block movement boolean set to true and that its transform position equals the location given. If both return true, then the method returns the entity. If the for each finishes without an entity being returned, it will return null. With our entities and check ready, it's time to create a couple of new actions. So open the action script. Now adding in our new bump and melee action. Let's break down what's going to happen here. Our bump action is a static public method that returns a boolean. And like the movement action, we pass both an entity and direction into it. It uses these to call our game manager's get blocking entity at location method, passing the sum of entity's transform position and direction into the call. If a blocking entity exists at the location, the local variable target is set to it. It then uses an if statement with its condition that the target needs not to be null, calling the melee action method if it exists, passing in the target while also returning false. Otherwise, movement action is called passing in both the given entity and direction before returning true. Our melee method is a void method that takes in an entity and it just debug logs a bit of text before ending the turn. Modifying the skip action to be more descriptive based on the entity provides us with if and else statements that consider which entity is skipping their action before displaying text, thus ending their turn. With our actions completed, for now, open the player script. Change the line containing our movement action to bump action. And add move key held equals to the start of it. Save, and then open the editor. Open the resources folder. Select our NPC and player prefabs using control. And set blocks movement to true on our entity component. Next, select just the NPC prefab and duplicate it. Renaming it to orc. Changing its image to lowercase o. and color on the sprite renderer components to red 63, green 127, and blue also 63. Now duplicate the orc prefab, rename it to troll, change its image to an uppercase T, and color on its sprite renderer components to red zero and also blue zero. Now open the map manager. Add a new in variable called max monster per room, give it a default of two, scroll down to the generate dungeon call, and include it before rooms. Remove our NPC instantiate, then use the rename symbol command to rename create player to create entity. We we'll add a new string parameter before exchanging the code within with a switch case that instantiates an entity based on the entity string given. Once exchanged, move over to the procgen script. Insert our new int variable into the generate dungeon method. Change line 48's if condition to if rooms.count not equal zero, cut and paste our tunnel between call into the statement and then cut the create entity call and paste it outside the for loop. Adding a player string to the create entity call and renaming new room to rooms with an index of zero. This is done when the player entity is instantiated and a call is made using the update field of view method within the entity that calls map managers set entities visibilities method. Now scroll down where we're going to create a private void method called place entities. 
It will take in both a rectangular room, new room, and int maximum monsters. A ton is going on, so let's start. We first get the number of monsters using the random dot range, zero being inclusive, and maximum monsters plus one being exclusive. After, we create a for loop, which loops until monster is equal to the number of monsters. We then, much like when we created our rooms, create x and y int variables using random.rain before proceeding to use an if statement to ensure that the x or y isn't equal to a boundary position of the room. If it is, then the loop will start again, else it continues to the next for loop, a for loop that goes through each entity within game manager's entity list, ensuring that the position doesn't match the x and y position. If it does, then it starts the loop again. Finally, a simple if statement is used to decide what create entity calls made before incrementing monster. Now to finish up, add place entities before room.add in our generate dungeon method and proceed to the editor. Now quickly heading to game manager, we're going to set the time to 0.005 and press play. It's time to let our entities move around and attack us. So first, import both A star and node into our algorithms folder using the links below in the description. Once done, create within the entity folder two folders, one called AI and the other types. Open the AI folder and create a new script called AI and then a folder called types. This folder will contain the various AI types now, open the Types folder and create a script called Hostile Enemy. Make your way over to the Types folder within Entity. Create a new Actor script before creating a folder called Components. We will also create a Fighter script within our Components folder before opening our Rectangular Room class. Make all our variables private, placing them on one line while we're at it and give them their getters and setters. This is to make it safe for code and instill good code practices. We are also going to do the same for our tile data class. Before heading over to our game manager. With game manager open, we will start with implementing a few new variables, a float called delay time, a new list of type actor called actors, followed by a sprite called dead sprite. Add in headers called time, entities and death, before renaming time to base time and entity num to actor num, entity num being renamed to actor num using the rename symbol command. Give actors and dead sprite their getters. Then scroll to our start turn method. We're going to be making a few changes here. The first being we're going to change all entity references to actors. We're then going to be giving our else if statement a new condition that checks if the actor has a hostile enemy component. If so, it will run its AI. Else, it will just call action.skip. Next, like start turn, we're going to also exchange entities for actors in end turn. Before changing time within our turn delay enumerator method to delay time. Remove the insert identity method and add four new ones. I won't explain what they all do as they explain themselves. However, I will explain that unlike the helper methods for entities, actors have a helper method called setTime. This method uses an arrow function that returns a float after dividing base time by the number of actors within the actors list. And before leaving for map manager, rename get blocking entity at location to get blocking actor at location using the rename symbol command before exchanging all entity references for actor. Add a dictionary called nodes, its key vector to int and value node. Create a getter for width and height, followed by a getter and setter for node. Go to our update fog map method and change it to use tile maps is visible and is explored getters. Before moving to proc gen, We'll scroll down to place entities method, use the rename symbol command to change its name to place actors, and change the code within to use our rectangular room getters. With our modifications completed, it's time to handle our new classes. Let's start by opening the entity class. Copy the code within the class before removing everything except blocks movement, its getter, and the move method. We will then add a new public void method called add to game manager. 
which will be used to add our entity to the entities list in our game manager. One last thing, we're going to also give blocks movement a setter as we want to use it from the actor class. Save the script and open the actor class. Paste the code we copied overriding the start and update methods. Change the inheritance to entity. Remove the block movement, its getter and the move method before making the following changes to our variable. Starting from the top, we're going to rename is sentient to is alive, set it to true by default, and do the same to its getter before giving it also a setter. The field of view now initializes its list and has a getter to boot. As we will be using AI, we will also add an AI variable, which we will set by using an onValidate method which checks if an AI component is attached to the actor's game object, setting our AI variable to it. Next, within our start method, we'll add a call to add game manager, replace entity with actor, remove the unneeded if statement if its condition is sentient, followed by removing field of view. Now save and open the player class, and give our fixed updates if statement a new condition of, Get component actor is alive. This condition is placed here, so our player can't move or attack when dead. Now save and open our fighter class. Change the public keyword to sealed in the class declaration and add a required component actor attribute. Now exchange the start and update methods with the following code. So, we are first creating our max HP, HP, defense, and power variables ints on one line before creating an actor variable called target. We set about getting getters for each variable except max HP, while also giving setters to HP and target. With the HP setter, we use mathf.max to ensure that no matter how much damage the fighter is dealt, the minimum HP is zero. Maxf.min is also used to ensure that no damage above the max HP is dealt. Once the HP is set, we use an if statement to check if HP equals zero, calling die if it does. A ton is happening in the die method. First, we debug log text based on whether a player component is attached to the same game object as the fighter class. Then, we get the sprite render, using it to set its sprite variable to the dead sprite on game manager, changing its color to red, and sorting order to zero. This is so other sprites can be shown over it. Next, we add remains of to its name before setting their attach actor class's blocks movement and is alive booleans to false using their getters. A final if statement is used to check if there is no player component attached, which calls the game manager's remove actor method, passing in our actor component. Now moving over to actions class. All right, here we will rename everything entity related to actor. Then remove the parameter from skip action, followed by its if and else statements. Finally, it's time to show our melee action some love. We'll start by giving it a new parameter of actor actor, then create a damage int using the actor's power minus the target's defense. A string variable called attack the script is set up using the actor's name and target's name before using an if statement with its condition being if the damage is greater than zero. If it is, then a debug log is used to signify damage being done, along with utilizing the subtraction assignment operator with the target's fighter component's HP getter on the left and the damage variable on the right. Else, it just debug logs that no damage has been done before calling game manager's end turn method. Quickly add in the actor requirement in our melee action within bump action and head over to the AI class. Now, we're going to add the required component attribute to make actor and A star required components. We then create an A star variable, the requirement that you must serialize the field and give it both a getter and setter. We then make sure to use on validate to get the A star components that's attached to the game object before adding a simple public void method called move along path that takes in a vector three int target position. The method will get the vector three int grid position, passing the transform position of the game object the script is attached to into a world to cell call. It will then use the ASAR algorithm to get a vector two direction by passing both the grid position and target position into its compute method. Note that they will need to be converted to vector two ints via casting. We then call the actor class's movement action, passing in the script's game object's actor compute components and our vector two direction. Pretty simple, right? Let's open the hostile enemy class now. 
we're going to proceed to do the following. We're going to add a required component attribute to make fire required before changing the inheritance from mono behavior to AI. Then we're going to add a fighter variable of fighter, a boolean called is fighting, and then an on validate method to set the fighter and a star variables to the components attached. And then to bring everything all together, we'll then create a public void method called runner AI. The method handles are attacking, moving, and turn skipping. It does so by using an if statement to check if there isn't a set fighter target, setting a target if there isn't. Otherwise, it uses an elf if statement to check if there is a fighter target and making sure it isn't alive. This else if was solely created to counter the AI from killing the remains of the player. Continuing, we then use an if statement to check if there is a target. If there is, we get the vector three into target position by calling world to cell passing in the target's transform dot position. An if statement is then used with its conditions being is fighting or that our attached actor components field of view contains the target position. If it is true, we use another if statement to make sure is fighting is true before creating a float variable called target distance, where we use vector3.distance to get the distance between the hostile enemy script's game object and the target. Once again, using an if statement, its condition being target distance less than 1.5, if the condition is true, then we attack the target using action.merely action, passing into it our active component and target before returning. Else, it makes a move along path call passing in its target position before returning. Finally, if all statements weren't met, then we call action.skip action, thus ends the saga of our AI. So, open the Unity Editor. With the Unity Editor now open, we're going to select every single NC prefab, remove their entity component, and adding the actor component. Set the block's movement to true, and select our player prefab. With our player prefab now selected, we're going to add the fighter component, giving it a max HP of 30, HP of 30, a defense of 2, and a power of 5. Before selecting both Orc and Troll, adding a hostile enemy component, selecting just the Orc, and giving it max HP of 10, HP of 10, a defense of 0, and a power of 3. Going to the troll prefab, give it a max HP of 16, a HP of 16, a defense of 1, and a power of 4. Now open the game manager, set base time to 0.075, and setting the dead sprite to the percent symbol. Press play, and enjoy your AI. I've left a picture for you to import into the resources folder. The link is below in the description. Once imported, right click in the hierarchy, hover over UI, and select Canvas. This creates both the Canvas and Event System game objects, selecting Event System, and click Replace with Input System UI Input Module in the inspector. Now selecting Canvas, we're gonna make the following changes. We're going to set the canvas components render mode to screen space camera. The render camera to our scenes camera. Our sorting layer to UI by first creating the UI layer before selecting it. We're gonna set canvas scales UI scale mode to scale screen size. Reference resolution to 1920 by 1080. And set match to one. With our canvas now done, right click it in the hierarchy and give it a child slider game object. Rename it to HP slider, select it, and in the inspector, set whole numbers within the slider component to true. Then we'll make a few quick changes to the rest of it. So expanding your HP slider, followed by expanding fill area, use shift and select background, fill area and fill before setting their React Transform Anchors to Stretch. We're then going to set Top, Bottom, Left and Right to zero. Now select Background and set its Image Color to Red 64, Green 16 and Blue 16. Then selecting Fill, setting its Image Color to Red 0, Green 96 and Blue 0. Lastly, expand handle slider area, 
select handle, and deactivate the image component. While we are done with the HP slider, we are missing vital text indicators. So give it a new text mesh pro object. You'll get a pop-up, click import TMP essentials, followed by clicking import TMP examples and extras. Once done, select our new text mesh pro object and rename it to HP slider text. Set its anchor to stretch, followed by setting top, bottom, left and right to zero. The font asset to Roboto, auto size to true, spacing options character 25, open extra settings and set margins left to 30. With our text set up, place the HP slider in the bottom left corner with its anchor set to bottom left and size it as you wish. Once you are satisfied with the placement, right click the canvas and create a scroll view game object. Select it and in the inspector set scroll reacts horizontal boolean to false and set both its horizontal and vertical scroll bars to none. Now expanding scroll view in the hierarchy, select both scroll bar objects and deactivate them. Next, expand viewport, select content, and add a grid layout group component before setting its constraint to fixed column count and one. Add a content size fitter, setting both the fits to preferred size. Proceed to duplicate the scroll view object in the hierarchy, renaming the original scroll view to last five messages. And do the following, set its anchor to bottom left, set the pos x to 1018, pos y to 16, followed by its width to 1050 and height 130. Deactivate its image component and set scroll react's vertical boolean to false. Open the viewport child, set the react transforms right to zero before opening the content child object. Here, we're going to rename it to last five messages content, set its anchor to bottom stretch, set the grid layout group padding bottom to five, and set cell size to 1040 by 25. And we're done with our last five messages. Now select the scroll view duplicate, rename it to message history, set the anchor to stretch, set top, bottom, left and right to 75, and set the image's source image to our imported message history PNG. Making sure to set the alpha to 255. Before selecting the viewport child, setting its top to 30 and the rest 25. Now opening its content child, rename it to message history content, anchor to bottom stretch, we're going to go ahead and set the grid layout groups padding left to 10 and bottom to 20. Its cell size is 1724 by 25. For setting its spacing Y to seven, we need to create a message prefab. Luckily, it's simple to do. Create a text mesh pro object within Canvas. Rename it to message and set the font asset to Roboto and auto size to true. Drag the message object into the resources folder and delete it from the hierarchy. Now add five of the message prefabs into the last five messages content game object. I'll explain why in a moment. In our scripts folder, create a new script called UI Manager and open it. Add the imports UniEngine.UI and TM Pro. Add a static instance variable referencing to UI manager and an awake method, followed by the following variables and headers. Most variables are created to help us manipulate our UI game object. The instance string variables are to help us add messages. And finally, the is method history open boolean and its getter. Let the player entity know when it can move around. Add three methods. 
The first, set health max, takes in a max HP int using it to set the max value of the HP slider. The second, set health, takes in both a HP and a max HP int using them to set the HP slider value to the given HP and text using string interpolation to HP colon HP forward slash max HP. And our third method is just to help us toggle the message history game object on and off and also set the is message history open state. Now, add our following method which is a public void add message method that takes in two string new message and color hex. We give it an if statement of last message equals new message that helps us control duplicate messages, which adds an incrementing value to the end of the last message before returning. We also place in an else if statement, its condition same message count greater than zero, which sets same message count to zero if true. If both statements aren't used, we change last message to new message, followed by instantiating a message prefab as textmas pro ugui. We then set the text to the new message and set its color to get color from hex methods return value passing in the color hex. The get color from hex method is just a helper method that utilizes Unity Engine's color utility. We give it a hex code and it returns a color. If we get no color, it just returns white. Now continuing with our add message method, we set the message prefab's parent to the message history content game object before using a for loop which loops over the last five messages content child count, incrementing each loop. It has an if statement that returns if the child count is less than i. Else, it moves forward getting the child textmas pro ugui components of the last five messages content and message history content, which in turn sets the last five message content child's text and color to the other message history content's child. Now, scroll up and add a start method that welcomes the player before opening the action class. Add a string variable called color hex below attack the script in milli action, giving it an empty string. Then create an if statement that gives color hex an actual hex code based on if our actor get component player returns true. Before exchanging our debug.log calls for our uni manager's add message method, making sure to pass in color hex at the end. Now open the fighter class and within the HP setter, add an if statement its condition being get component player, which calls uni manager's set health method if true, passing in HB and max HB. Next, create a start method that like the HP setter contains an if statement that checks for our get component player, calling set health max and set health if true. For exchanging our debug.logs in die, for calls to the UI manager's add message method, open the uni editor backup, navigate to the entity folder, double click controls, and add a new action called view, setting the binding to V, making sure to also set the arrow keys boolean to true. Save the asset before opening the player class. Here, we're going to create a new if statement in the fixed update method that checks that the UI manager's is message history open boolean is false, which of course stops the player from moving if it isn't. Finally, we add a public void on view method which takes in our callback context and has an if statement that checks context.performed that we use to open and close the message history game object. Save and go back to the editor. Navigate back to scripts and drag the UI manager onto the canvas game object. We're gonna set up its components. Deactivate the message history game object. Opening the resource folder and drag the canvas into it. Just gonna quickly remove the new text messages and press play. Thomas thought the reason for us to be in dungeons in the first place, items, or more importantly, hoarding items. So head into your entity's types folder and create a new item script. Then open in the components folder, create two scripts the first called consumable and the second inventory. Now open the entity class. We'll change the code within the add to game manager method to use the game manager's add entity method. Proceed over the game manager and add to the add entity method an if condition that checks the active state of an entity's game object, turning it on if off with an entity.gameObject.setActive call passing in true. Finally, add another entity.gameObject.setActive call passing in false to turn off the entity's game object within our remove entity method. With our quick changes out of the way, open the actor class, add a new inventory variable along with its getter, 
Dare to add an if condition to the onValidate method, checking if there's an inventory attached to the actor class's game object, setting the inventory variable to it if true. Once done, open the fighter class, and we're going to add a hill method that takes in an int amount and returns an int value. It will, from the top, first check with an if condition if HP equals max HP, returning 0 if so. Else, it will create a new local variable called new HP value, which is the sum of HP and amount. It then uses another if condition to check if new HP value is more than max HP, setting new HP value to max HP if true, before finally creating a new amount recovered variable by subtracting HP from new HP value using the HP setter equals new HP value and returning the amount recovered. Open the new item class, changing its inheritance to entity. We're going to add a private consumable variable alongside a getter. Then add an onValidate method that checks for the consumable components, setting consumable to it if true, before using the start method to call add to game manager. Remove the update method. And with our item class set up, open the consumable class. We're going to add a require component type of item attribute, an enum called consumable type, and two variables, a consumable type variable and an int variable called amount. We're going to give both variables getters before adding our active method that takes in an actor and item using a switch case that checks the consumable type, which in this case is healing. It will return the result of the healing method, passing in both the actor and item into the healing call. The healing method itself is a Boolean method that takes, as you can tell, an actor and item. It firstly creates a local int variable called amount recovered using the result of our Friday class's heal method before using an if condition to check if amount recovered is greater than zero, calling both add message and consume before returning true. The consume method is a helper method that helps remove our item from the actor's inventory before destroying it. Back to the healing method, else it calls add message and returns false. Time to quickly take care of our inventory, so open the inventory class. We're going to add a require component type of actor attribute, two variables, an int called capacity, and a list of item called items, making sure to initialize it. We're going to give both variables getters before adding a drop method that takes in an item. This method will remove the item from the items list, setting its transform parent to null, turning its sprite render component on, and calling the add to game manager method within the item class. Finally, an add message call is made to signify that the item has been dropped. Open the action class, remove the escape action as it's not needed anymore, before adding in our new actions. Starting with the pickup action that takes in an actor, it uses a for loop to go through the game manager's entities list, checking if an entity has an actor component or doesn't match the transform position of the actor object given continuing to the following entity in the list if either is true. If both checks are false, we check to see if the actor's inventory count is greater than or equal to his capacity, calling add message before returning if so. We create a local item variable and set it to the entity's item component, setting the entity's transform to the actor's by calling set parent and adding it to the actor's inventory list. We call add message that the item has been picked up before removing the item from the game manager's entities list, calling the remove entity method and ending the turn. Moving on, our drop action method takes in an actor and item. It calls the actor's inventory's drop method using the item before closing the drop menu and ending the turn. Lastly, we have the use action method, which takes in an actor and an int named index. A local item variable is created, setting it to the item within the actor's inventory using the index. We then make a boolean called item used before checking to see if the item's game object has a consumable attached. If it does, item used equals what our consumable's active method returns. A further check is made to see if item used equals false, returning if true. Else, we call toggle inventory and end the turn. Just want to clarify, you didn't miss a step. We'll get to those menus soon if you're wondering about the new toggles. Moving over to our map manager, add in a new int variable called max items per room with its default being two. Add it to the generate dungeon call just before the rooms variable within our start method. Before adding a new case potion of health to our switch case in create entity. We'll create this prefab after we've done our menus. Now go to the proc gen class, add max items per room to its generate dungeon method. 
and the place actors call within it. Now scroll down to place actors, rename it to place entities with the renamed symbol command, and give it a new int parameter called maximum items. From here, create a new local int variable called number of items, which is set to the number given using random.range with our maximum items parameter being passed in. Copy the for loop and paste it below. Exchange monster for item and number of monsters for number of items. Lastly, replace the if condition with a create entity call, passing in potion of health and the vector to position. Save and open the UI manager. Import uniengine.event systems and a variable referencing it. As we'll work with multiple menus, we also want to add an is menu open boolean. Now create two headers, inventory UI and dropdown menu UI, each having a boolean called is inventory open or is dropdown menu open. We're going to give them two game object variables that we use to reference their future UI game objects, inventory and inventory content, followed by drop menu and drop menu content. We're going to provide getters for our newly implemented booleans so our player script can access them. Add in two methods to support our inventory and dropdown menus. They work in the same way as our toggle menu history method, only we have an added if statement that once the menu is opened, it calls the update menu method passing in our actor component with a content game object. This method, scrolling to the bottom, first uses a for loop to clear all UI game objects of their text, listeners as we're using buttons, and turning them off within the provided content game object. Second, it creates a local char variable of A, then uses another for loop to increment over the items in the actor's inventory component. We're using I to get the child within the content game object, which we use to set the text of that child's child text game object, incrementing the char variable each loop, adding in two listeners, the first based on if menu content equals a specific menu, providing either the use action or drop action methods. The second is a call to UI menu itself. The child game object is then turned on. Once the for loop is done, it uses our event system variable to set the selected game object as the content game object's first child. This is important as it lets us use our arrow keys to move up and down on the menu. Finally, before moving on, we'll add a method called toggle menu to provide a little quality of life by deactivating our menus with a single key. Open the Unity Editor back up and then proceed to open our controls. We're going to add three new input actions called Inventory, which uses the I key, Pickup, which uses the G key, and Drop, which uses the D key. Click Save Asset if Auto Save isn't turned on. And open the player class. Change our is message history open for is menu open in fix updates first if condition. And add it as an or condition in the on view method. Along with UI manager dot instance dot is message history open. We also want to change the on exit method to call our UI manager's toggle menu method. Then add in three new methods. They function relatively the same as the onView method, calling specific menu toggles after meeting certain conditions, plus the added if statements condition of inventory's items count is greater than zero, except for the onPickup method, which calls actions pickup action once performed. Go back to the editor, open resources, double clicking the canvas prefab. We're gonna duplicate the message history object Rename the duplicate to inventory. Set our anchor to top center. Make it smaller. And position it to the left. Deactivate the vertical boolean. And set the movement type to clamped. Now, rename the message history content game object within to the inventory content. Set its anchor to top stretch, padding to all zero, cell size to 415 by 30, its spacing Y to one. Before giving it a new child button game object, naming it item placeholder, 
set its highlighted color and selected color to a light green, its press color to a dark green, and set the disabled color to red. Select its Text Mesh Pro Child Game Object, make its font asset Roboto, auto size to true, and character spacing to 30. Now drag the item placeholder into the resources folder before duplicating it 25 times within the content game object. Next, we're going to add a new TextMesh Pro game object, setting it as a child to the inventory game object. We're going to change the text to select an item to use, set its font asset to Roboto, auto size to true, and its character spacing to 10. And also its alignment to center. Just before we move on, we're going to go back to inventory and deactivate the image component. Now, selecting our item placeholder prefab, we're going to set the color to black and its text color to white. I forgot to set the target graphic, so we're just gonna change it to the text graphic instead. Now opening the canvas prefab again, we're going to duplicate our inventory. We're going to move our text mesh object just to the top. I've decided to add an underline to text mesh pro object and I've set the position X on inventory content to zero. Anyways, we're going to duplicate our inventory now, rename it to drop menu, Rename the inventory content to drop menu content. And change the text within drop menu's child text mesh program object to select item to drop. Just going to leave them deactivated for when we use them. And we're going to add our new objects to the UI manager script. Of course, in the hierarchy, we're going to add in our event system. It's time to handle our entity prefabs, and let's start up by creating a potion of health. So, first in the hierarchy, we're going to create a 2D object square. We're going to name it potion of health, adding to it the consumable script. We're going to give it a new sorting layer of entity. The order and layer, of course, would be one. And for the sprite, we're going to change it to an exclamation mark. Changing its color to purple. The transform quickly. And we can drag it into the, our resources folder. So it's a prefab. With our potion of health prefab traded, we're going to select all entities, minus the potion of health, of course. We're going to make sure that their sprite render is turned on. And set their sorting layer to entity and order and layer to two. Next, just selecting player, we're going to add to it an inventory component. Set the capacity to 26. And let's actually set the amount on our potion of health. Give it a four. Now pressing play. The tutorial I used to create mine required individual keys for our inventory and drop down menus. I've opted to save time and use what Unity provided via its event system support. We'll import our radius image link below in the description, which we use for our player targeting. We're going to set its pixels per unit to 16, its filter mode to point, max size to 32, and compression to high quality before clicking apply. From here, we're going to open up our scripts folder Head over to Entity, AI, Types, and create a new script called Confused Enemy. Now go back into Entity, Types, Components. Here we're going to create a new consumables folder. Head on into it and create the following scripts. Confusion, Fireball, Healing, and lightning. With our scripts created, open the actor script, create a getter for the AI, 
and also a setter. Open the AI script. We're going to create a public virtual void for our run AI method. Then opening our hostile enemy, we're going to add override to our public void run AI method. And head over to our confused enemy class. Remove the start and update methods. And change the inheritance to AI. Give it a require component attribute of type of actor. I've also added a little summary so you know what it's all about. We're going to give it two variables, which is previous AI and turns remaining. Turns remaining, of course, being an int variable. Followed by both getters and setters for them. And of course, we're going to add in our logic, which once again, we're creating a public override void method of run AI, which will do the following. It's going to use an if statement to check if turns remaining is less than equal zero, calling add message, before changing the AI back to the previous AI and calling its run AI, destroying the script. Else, it's going to get a random vector to int direction using random.range and a quick switch case before calling action.bump action, passing in get component actor and direction for decrementing turns remaining. It's been about a week since the last video and in that time I made a design change from using enums in a simple switch case to giving consumables their own individual classes. So in our changes we're going to quickly grab the amount, healing and activate methods and drag it into the new healing class. Next going back to consumable, remove the enum we're going to add in three virtual boolean methods. The first being activate, which takes in an actor, and the other two being two cast methods that take in an actor and a target actor for an actor and a list of actors. Finally, we're going to remove the item parameter from consume, rename actor to consumable, and change it to a public method. Next, we're going to add a new if statement which is going to be checking our inventory for a selected consumable and checking if it matches up with this consumable. If it does, then it's going to set selected consumable to none. And lastly, since we have removed item and renamed actor to consumer, we're just going to quickly fix up our code a bit. You'll notice now that I'm using get component item to select the item, open up the inventory script and add in our new selected consumable variable, along with it, both a getter and setter for it that out of the way, head over to healing, remove the item parameter from activate, rename act the consumer, and cut and paste the code within the healing method to the activate method, moving the healing method in the process. Remove item from consume, and change actor to consumer. Now changing inheritance to consumable, and making sure to add override. Head over to confusion, I'll fast track a little bit, we're going to change the mono behavior inheritance to consumable. We're going to add in a new int variable called number of turns. We're going to set it to a default of 10 and provide it a getter. Then we're going to create a public override boolean activate method, which takes in a consumer, which will get the consumer's inventory component and set the selected consumable to this. Next, it will also grab the consumable's player component and toggle target mode. A method will set up shortly before finally calling add message and returning false. We then create a public override boolean cast method, which takes in the consumer and target actors using an if statement to check if the target has a confused enemy component. If it does, it uses another if statement to check turns remaining greater than zero. If turns remaining is greater than zero, then it calls the UI manager's instance.add message before setting the inventory selected consumable to null and once again calling the player toggle target mode before returning false. Else, it's going to say confuse enemy equals target dot game object dot add component confuse enemy. After adding the component, it's going to set the confuse enemy's previous AI variable to the target's AI and its turns remaining variable to the number of turns before calling add message, setting the target's AI to confuse enemy before consuming the confusion consumable. Finally, it calls play's toggle target mode and returns true, opening firewall. We'll change model behavior to consumable, give it to int variables, damage and radius, giving them a, a default of 12 and 3, and then giving them getters. Next, we create two methods, activate and cast, one taking consumer and the other taking consumer and targets. The activate method, much like the confusions activate method, sets the selected consumable within the inventory component to this before calling the player's toggle target mode, passing in both true and the radius before calling add message and returning false. The cast method uses the list actor targets 
with an for each, calling add message and getting each individual targets fire the components using the HP setter within it to minus equal the damage dealt by the fireball. Once the loop is complete, it consumes the consumable and calling the player's toggle target mode method, returning true. Lastly, opening up lightning, we change the inheritance of consumable, we give it two int variables, damage, maximum range, and the faults of 20 and 5, providing them getters, and two methods, activate and cast. The activate method works the same as the confusion activate method, while the cast, while the cast method calls add message, reduces the target's fighter's HP using its setter, before consuming the item, calling the player's toggle target mode method, and returning true. Now opening the action script, we're going to change the int parameter within use action to item item. Remove this line of code. Adjusting what our activate method takes in. And we're going to do a bit of a change around. Placing toggle inventory above the if statement for the item used. And changing the not equal item used to just item used. Just changing the parameter for a little bit of a clarity. Now head down to the skip action and use rename symbol to change it to wait action because it doesn't make much sense having it called skip action anymore finally as we are using spells we're going to create two cast actions importing system.collections.generic both cast action methods work relatively the same it takes in a consumer target or targets and the consumable before creating a local boolean cast success variable which equals consumable.cast consumer target or targets if the cast is a success then it calls game managers end turn method open the editor back up double click controls and we're going to create a new confirm action setting its binding to enter Include it in the arrow keys control scheme and save the asset. All right, heading back into our scripts, we're gonna open the game manager and we're going to scroll down and we're going to change the get component hostile enemy to AI. Scrolling down, we're going to rename get blocking actor at location to get actor at location using rename symbol. Now heading over into player, I made a mistake. We're going to set it to actors, actor num dot AI, not equal null. We're going to cut is valid position, opening the map manager, scrolling down and paste it. Get rid of future position equals transform dot position from the if statement and tweak the code a little. Open entity and within the move method, we're now going to change it so it actually uses the is valid position from map manager. Make sure to also change private to public for our is valid position method. Heading back to player, rename move player to move and get rid of the if statement. Now, now we're back to the top, we're going to add in two new booleans followed by a game object. They being target mode is single target and target object. We're also going to rename move key held to move key down. Now in the on movement method, we'll be using an if statement to check if the context has started and we're also going to check if the actor is alive. If this is true, then it's going to check for target mode equals true and move key down is not true. And if that's true, it's going to set move key down to true and call the move method. Else, if target mode is not true, it will set the move key down to true. Finally, else if context.cancelled is true, then the move key down will equal false. In our on exit method, we'll be making another check, checking if the is menu open variable is set to true within our UI manager. And if it is, then we're going to call toggle menu else if it's target mode, we're going to call toggle target mode, which navigating down is a public method that takes in a boolean is area and an int radius. It's going to set target mode to true or false, depending on its state, before using an if statement to check if target mode is true. And if it is, it's also going to check target object.transferPosition is not equal to the transform.position of the player. If the condition comes up true, then the target object.transform.position will be changed to the player's transform.position. Another if statement is then used to check if is area is true, causing our is single target to equal false and setting the local scale of the target object accordingly. We're also turning on the child object of target object, else it will set is single target to true before setting target object to true, before turning on the target object. Else, if the target object's child is turned on, it's going to turn it off before turning off the target object, game object, and setting the player's inventory component 
selected consumable to null. Scrolling back up, we're going to add a new if statement on pickup called can add. This is just the helper method that deals with the player's state. Checking if target mode is true, if the menu is open, and if the player actor isn't alive, returning false if so, else it returns true. In the on inventory method, we exchange UI manager dot instance dot is menu open not equal to true with the can act method. Doing the same to the on drop method. We then implement our new on confirm method due to us adding a new input action, which checks if the context has been performed, if the target mode is true, and if is single target is true. If is single target is true, then an actor target is set using single target checks. A helper method that uses a vector free target position to create a local variable actor called target using the game managers dot instance dot actor at location passing in said target position whereupon if no target is found it calls ui manager dot instance dot add message before returning null. It also further checks if the target found is the actor that is the player itself calling another add message before returning null else if it just returns the target actor. We do a quick check to see the target is not null before calling the action.cast action, passing in our actor, the target found, and our inventory selected consumable. Else, adding in a system.collections.generic import, we get a list of actor targets using area target checks, our final helper method scrolling down, that takes in a vector three target position, creates an int radius using the target object's child local scale, minus one, to account for the center. It then creates a local variable bounds target bounds using the target position as the center before creating a radius around it using vector3.1 times radius times two. It then creates a target's list, initializes it, and uses a for each loop to cycle through all the actors within the bounds using an if statement, target bounds dot contains target.transform.position before adding it. Once the for each is done, it checks to see if the targets.count is equal to zero. If so, it calls add message and returns null, else it returns the targets. Coming back to on confirm, we check if targets is not equal to null before calling action.cast action, passing in our actor component, the targets, and then select the consumable for my inventory. In our fixed update method, we're going to add another condition to our first if statement. Checking to see that target mode is set to false. This is done so our player doesn't move while we're in target mode and vice versa. Now heading back to our move method, we're going to get rid of the code after future position, followed by adding in a new if statement to check if it's target mode, which if so, will set the future position to the target object plus a rounded direction. Else it sets the future position to the transfer position plus our rounded direction. Finally, we add a further if statement once again, checking if it's target mode, which if true, creates a vector three int target grid position using map managers instance floor map dot world to self passing in our future position. We then call map managers is valid position passing our future position and also check to see that our play's field of view contains the target grid position, setting our target object dot position to that future position if so. Else, we set the move key down state to the return value of action.bump action passing in actor and around position. Going to our map manager, we're going to add in three new cases within our create entity method, which creates a fireball confusion and lightning scroll. Opening proc gen, we're going to go to place entities and exchange our map manager.instance.create entity with a local variable called random value, which gets a random value between zero and one and goes through a set of if and else statements to decide which entity to create. Now quickly heading over to our UI manager script, we're gonna give a bit more meaning to our for loops. So within the first for loop, we're going to rename the i to reset num and the second for loop to item num. We're gonna add a new local variable of item item which is set to the actor.inventory.items item num. And we're going to change the actor.inventory.items.name to item.name, making use of our new local variable, followed by exchanging the i minus one with item. Opening the uni editor back up, we're gonna to go to resources, double click our potion of healing, and add the healing script to it. Get rid of the consumable script, and drag our healing script onto the consumable variable. Set the amount to four. Now we're going to duplicate the potion of healing, 
delete the healing script and change the sprite to the following icon. We'll change this to yellow, add the lightning script, and then rename it to lightning scroll. Duplicate the lightning scroll, change it to red, add the fireball script, and of course rename it. Once more, but for the confusion scroll, All right, double-clicking the player prefab, we're going to right-click on the player, go to 2D Object, Sprites, Square, set the sorting layer to Entity, and the ordering layer to 3. Rename it to Target, right-click on Target, 2D Object, Sprites, another square, and call it Radius. Set the sorting layer to Fog, and ordering layer to 1. We're going to change the sprite to our new Radius PNG, we're going back to target and setting the alpha to, I suppose, about half. Now selecting both target and radius, we're going to turn them off, click on player, and we're going to drag target into the target object variable. Clicking play. And it's that easy. We're going to go to Odin Spectre's download page. Link will be down below in the description. And we're going to click open source serializer. From here, we're going to simply click download which will give you the Odin Serializer Unity package. You're going to go ahead and right click it, open with, and choose another app. We'll be using Unity 2021.3 20, as it's the current version that we're using for the project, and click OK. Import everything, create a new folder called Plugins, dragging both Odin Serializer and TextMesh Pro into it. Now open the Scenes folder, rename Sample Scene to Dungeon, and create a new scene called Main Menu. Press File, Build Settings, and drag Main Menu into the Scenes in Build, making sure that it's an index of zero. All right, opening our Scripts folder, we're going to create two new scripts, one Save Manager and the other Main Menu. Open up our Save Manager. I'm going to fast track a little bit. Starting for our imports, we're going to be using Unity Engine, Odin Serializer, System.io, Systems Collections Generic, and Unity Engine Management. We're going to create a Save Manager instance, three variables, and int a string and save data, which our current floor with a default of zero, save file name being a default of save the dot koala, and save, which we initialize. This is followed by creating getters and setters for both our current floor and save variables. Before using the awake method, we create an instance, making sure to pass into the if statement, don't destroy on load, passing in the save manager game object. We have a public Boolean method called has save available, which uses a local string variable called path, which is a combination of both application persistent data path and the save file name. It checks if a file doesn't exist using the path, returning false if so, otherwise returns true. Before continuing with our methods, we're gonna scroll down here we have two public classes called save data and scene state, making sure to add to both of them a system.serializable attribute. Within the save data class, we have two variables, the first being an int called save floor, and the second being a list of scene states called scenes. Each of them have their own getters and setters, followed by a constructor, which sets them to their defaults. Within the scene state, we have three variables, an int called floor number, a game state called game state, and a map state called map state. They also have their own getters and setters, followed by a constructor, which sets the variables to the parameters given. Scrolling back up, within the public void save game method, we set the save variable save floor variable to the current floor, followed by creating a local boolean method called has seen, which is set to true or false using save.scenes.find, looping through all the available scenes to see if we can find a floor number variable that matches the current floor, making sure it's not null. And if statements in use, checking if has seen is true, calling the update scene, passing in save states, else add scene, passing in save state. This is followed by creating a path, combining application of persistent data path and the save file name, a local byte array called save JSON, which uses Odin serializer serialization utility.serialize value, passing save, and then setting the data format to JSON before using file.write or bytes, passing in both the path and the local save JSON variable. I'll explain the save state in just a moment. Moving on to our load game method, we create a local variable called path, once again passing in both our persistent data path and our save file name, creating a local byte array of save JSON, which is set to file, read, or bytes, 
passing in the path. And then we set the save variable to what is returned using serialization utility dots, the serialized value with a type of save data, passing our save JSON local variable and setting the data format to JSON. Our current floor variable is then set the save floor variable, followed by using an if statement to check the active scene's name is not dungeon, which will use scene managers.load scene, passing in dungeon. Else, a new local variable scene state is created, which is set to whatever is returned by using save.scenes.find, looping through every single available scenes and checking if their floor number matches the current floor. If the scene state is not null, it then proceeds to load the state, passing in the scene state. Else, it uses debug.log error, informing us that there's no save data for the floor. The delete save method is pretty simple. It simply it gets the path as usual before using file.delete and passing in the path, which will get rid of our save file. There are two of our helper methods, add scene and update scene, which both take in a scene state with add scene using an arrow function to add the scene state to save's list of scenes. Meanwhile, with the update scene, it sets one of the scenes within the scenes variable within our save variable, making sure to pass in the index, which would be current floor minus one to equal the scene state. As mentioned earlier, we have two other methods, they being save state and load state, with save state returning a scene state, which uses an arrow function, new scene state, passing in the current floor, the game manager's instance.save state, and the map manager's.instance.save state. With the load state taking in a scene state to call map manager's.instance load state, and also the game manager's.instance the load state, passing into those load states their own separate states contained within the scene state. Now opening up our main menu script, We'll be using four imports, UniEngine, UniEngine.SceneManagement, UniEngine.UI, and UniEngine Event Systems. You'll have two variables, a private event system called event system, and a private button called continue button. We'll make use of the start method. You use an if statement that calls save managers has save available method, checking if the boolean returned is false, which is set the continue button interactable to false. Else, if you use the event system variable, the call set selected game object, passing in the continue button dot game object. We then have three methods, new game, continue game, and quit game, all of which are public voids with new game, which uses an if statement, the call save managers has save available, which upon returning true, will call save managers delete save method. It will then set save managers current floor variable to one before calling save managers load scene, passing in dungeon, and both continue game and quit game being pretty straightforward. Now opening up the AI class, we're going to create a new public class called AI state. It will have a private string variable called type, providing both a getter, setter, and constructor with a string parameter called type with a default empty string. We slap on a system dot serializable, followed by adding a public virtual AI state save state method to the end of our AI class. Open the confused enemy script. Create a public class called confused state, which inherits the AI state. The class will contain two private variables, a string called previous AI, and an int called turns remaining. They get as setters, followed by a constructor whose parameters are a string called type, an AI called previous AI, and an int called turns remaining. Each parameter has its default set accordingly. The constructor uses the base AI state to handle our type string before adding a system.serializable to the top of our confused state. Within our confused enemy class, we add two methods. The first is an override method for the save state method. We use an arrow function to create a new confused state, passing in a confused enemy string for the type, and confused enemy's previous AI, and turns remaining. The second is a public void load state that takes in a confused state, which we named state. We use an if statement to check if the state's previous AI is hostile enemy, setting the previous AI to it, if true, using get component hostile enemy. We then set the confused enemy's turn remaining to the states. Now quickly opening the hostile enemy script, add a public override save state to clarify that the AI type is hostile enemy during serialization. Onwards to our entity script, we create a public class called entity state. We give it an entity type enum to differentiate entities in both serialization and deserialization. Five variables, Entity type type, a string called name, two booleans, blocks movement and is visible, followed by a vector three position. As always, give them getters and setters, and a constructor that takes in each variable. We add a system.serializable to the top of entity states and head on up. While creating part 10, I changed how I handle the add to game manager method. So we add in a virtual keyword to the method, an if statement that checks for the player component, calling game manager's insert entity method, if true, else it calls its add entity method instead. Throw in a public virtual save state method that returns an entity state and open our actor script. 
We're going to create a new actor state class that inherits the entity state, give it three variables, a boolean called is alive, an OI state called current AI, and a fighter state called fighter state, providing them both getters and setters. We also create a constructor that takes in each variable that also makes use of the base AI states constructor. Scrolling to the top, we're going to add a new fighter variable called fighter and another if statement to check if we have the fighter component attached in the onValidate method. Next, create a new public override void add to game manager method, which uses the base add to game manager method and copy and paste in our if statement above in the start method. We're going to exchange our algorithm equals new add invisibility and update field of view with a new if statement and else if statement where we check to see if the actor is alive, which would call our algorithm equals new atom visibility and update the field of view. Else, if it isn't alive, it checks to see if the fighter is not equal to null, which will call the fighter's die method. You will notice that die is currently sending an error. That's due to it being a private method, but we'll get back to it. Scrolling down, we add in a public override save state method, which returns an entity state and a public void load state, which we pass into an actor state. Now starting with the save state, we use an arrow function to create a new actor state using the actor state's constructor, which would pass into the name of the object, if it blocks movement or not, if it's alive, if it's visible by checking map manager's visible tiles, which currently passes an error due to there not being a getter for the visible tiles and passing in the vector free int position of the entity to it. Then passing in the transform.position and checking if AI is not equal to null, which if true calls AI.save state, otherwise it sets it to null. We then check if the fighter variable is not equal to null, which if true calls fighter's save state method, else it sets it to null. In our load state method, and using the actor state provided, we set the transform position of the entity to the state's position. It's is alive boolean to the state's is alive boolean. We then use an if statement to check if the entity isn't alive, whereupon we remove the actor from the game manager, followed by another if statement, which checks to see if the is visible variable within our state is set to false. If that's true, it uses get component sprite renderer dot enables and sets it to false. Another if statement is then used Used to check if the current AI is not equal to null. If true, it checks to see which type it is, getting the component of said type and setting the AI to it. If the type of the AI equals hostile enemy, then it simply sets the AI using get component hostile enemy. Else, if the type is confused enemy, it adds a new component confuse enemy to the game object, setting the AI to it before creating a new confused state using state.currentAI as confused state and casting our AI variable so we can access the confused enemy load state method, passing our confused state. Lastly, we use another if statement to check if the state.fighter state is not equal to null, which if true calls fighters.load state, passing the state.fighter state. Opening the item script, click the start method to use an arrow function, so it's a one-liner. We're going to create a new item state which inherits the entity state, giving it a string variable called parent, providing both a getter and setter for it, and a constructor, which like the actor state constructor, makes use of the base entity state's constructor. We add in, as usual, two methods, a save state and a load state, the save state being an override for the virtual, which uses an arrow function to get a new item state, passing in name, blocks movement, checking to see if the visible tiles contains our vector free int position, the transform.position, and it checks that the transform.parent is not equal to null, setting parent the transform.parent.game object's name, otherwise it sets it to a blank string if false. In our load method, it uses the item state state parameter to check if the state.isVisible is false, setting using get component sprite renderer.enable, turning off the sprite renderer in our game object if so. If the state.parent variable is not equal to a blank string, then it creates a game object parent local variable which equals game object dot find passing a state dot parent string which then uses the parents dot get component inventory calling dot add a method that we're passing in this script and is a new method that we'll get to soon we then set the transform dot position to the state's position now open the consumable script we're going to add another line of code to it which calls the game managers remove entity passing in get component item opening the fighter script we're going to change the seal declaration to a public one Navigating to our die script, we're going to change it to public. We're going to add a new if statement to it, which checks to see if the actor entity is alive. And once going through the normal process, it's going to set the actors is alive variable to false. 
we're going to remove the unnecessary get component actor that is a live variable before scrolling down. We're going to create a new public fighter state class which holds five variables, four of them being ints, max HP, HP, defense, and power, and a single string called target, providing them getters and setters and a constructor that takes in all its variables. Scrolling up. We had two methods, a save state that returns a fighter state, which uses an arrow function to get a new fighter state, passing in our max HP, HP, defense, power, and checking if the target is not equal to null. If true, it sets it to target name, otherwise it sets it to null. Second, the load state method that uses the fighter state to set the four int variables of the fighter class to those of the fighter states in variable before making call to the game managers dot actors variable which uses the find method to check to see if any of the names within the actors list is that of the state dot targets setting the target to it opening the inventory as informed earlier we're going to create a public void add method that takes in an item it uses items dot add to add the item to the items list using item.transform.set parent, passing in the transform of the item's game object before making a final call to the game manager to remove the entity, passing in the item. Now open action, we're going to exchange these two lines, item.transform.set parent and actor.inventory to actor.inventory.add, passing in the item, while also removing game manager.instance remove entity. Heading into the game manager script, we're going to import uniengine.cmanagement, navigate to the bottom, we're going to create a public class game state, which has a private list entity state called entities, getter and setter for it, and a constructor that takes in the list entity state. Going back to the top, we're going to make use of the scene manager, subscribing to onscene loaded, which is scene manager dot scene loaded plus or equals onscene loaded, which allows us to use the onscene loaded method, which creates a local scene state using save manager instance save.scenes.find method, which loops through the scenes variable, checking to see if a floor number matches the save manager instance current floor variable. We then use an if statement to check if the scene state is not null, which calls the load state method, passing in scene state or game state, else it initializes entities and actors. Which scrolling up, just going to remove the initialization and scrolling to add entity. We're going to add in the new insert entity method that we talked about earlier which much like that entity method, it checks if the game object is not active before setting it to true and then inserting it into the entities list. Finally, navigating. We're going to add in three methods called save state, load state, and load entity states. The save state method returning a game state, which uses a for each to cycle through every single item within the player's inventory, checking if the entity list contains said item, which if so, will continue the loop, else it will call the add entity method passing in the item. This is followed by creating a game state called game state, which will equal a new game state passing in entities dot convert all and using X to loop through every single entity calling save state. We then use a new for each to cycle through every single item within the inventory items list, calling remove entity passing in the item before returning the game state variable. In the low state method, which takes in a game state called state, we first set the is player turn boolean to false, which prevents the player from moving during the load. We use an if statement to check if the entity's list dot count is greater than zero. If so, it uses a for each to go through every single entity destroying its game object before clearing both the entities and actors list. We then use the start coroutine method passing in load entity states along with our state.entities. The load entity states method is a private method that takes in a list of entity states called entity states. It creates a local int variable called entity state, which is set to zero, and then uses a while loop with its condition being entity state is less than entity states.count. We use you return new wait for end of frame before creating a local string variable called entity name, which uses a ternary with its condition being entity states passing in entity state as the index dot name dot contains remains of. If this is true, entity name equals entity states passing in entity state dot name dot substring. And within the substring, we pass in entity states index entity state dot name dot last index of space plus one. If not true, entity name simply equals entity states index of entity state dot name. And if condition is then used, where if the entity states index entity state dot type equals entity state dot entity type dot actor, a local actor state called actor state is created with the entity state as an actor state. We then create a local actor variable 
with map manager.instance.create entity passing in the entity name, actor state.position, and using .get component actor before loading the actor state. Else, if the entity state.type equals entity state.entity type.item, an item state is created with that entity state as an item state. For creating an item using once again map manager.instance.create entity passing the entity name, item state.position.get component item for loading the item state. We then increment item state which will continue the process until entity state equals entity states dot count. The is player turn boolean is then set to true, which allows the player to move. Heading on over to the tile data class, we're going to add in a new private string called name, it's getter and setter, and then we're going to create a constructor which takes in every single variable before going to the map manager script. Starting from the bottom, we're going to create a map state class which will hold a private dictionary of a vector three tile data called stored tiles, a list of rectangular room called stored rooms, their getters and setters, and a constructor that takes in both the dictionary and list. Our stored tiles will be set using tiles.toDictionary, making sure to import system.link, which will cycle through every single key within the tiles dictionary, casting every single key to a vector three in the process, while our stored rooms are just set to rooms. Going to the top, we're going to import in the engine.scene management. Remove all initializations from rooms, visible tiles, and tiles. Creating a getter for visible tiles. Before, like game manager, we're going to subscribe to on scene loaded, a method that will use to create a scene state variable called scene state, which we'll find using save manager.instance.save.scenes.find, looping through all available scenes, checking to see if their floor number matches the state manager.instance.current floor. We then, we then use an if statement to check that the scene state is not null, calling load state, passing in our scene state dot map state, else we call generate dungeon, a method that cutting out our code here. We'll initialize our rooms, tiles, and visible tiles, followed by joining our dungeon as per normal, before moving to the create entity method and refactoring what we're using here. So you may notice that a lot of this code is just duplications of one another. So what we're going to do is make use of string interpolation to cut it down to creating a local game object called entity object, instantiating the said game object, passing in our entity string using string interpolation, a new vector three, our position and the identity before renaming the entity object to the entity string and returning it, making sure that it returns a game object and not a void. Scrolling down, we're going to making use of our tile data constructor with name equaling tile map dot get tile return dot name and is explored and is visible set to false. Going down to set up fog map within our for each statement, we're going to add a new if statement setting that tiles alpha to half, else it sets it to one. Adding in the two state methods with our public save state returning a map state, which uses an arrow function to return a new map state passing in tiles and rooms, before finally our load state taking in a map state, it will set our rooms variable to the map state stored rooms and tiles to our map state's stored tiles, which will use the to dictionary method to cycle through every key within our stored tiles dictionary. Our tiles will equal our map state stored tiles, but it'll call to dictionary, so it cycles through every single individual tile, casting it to a vector three int with the value remaining the same. An if statement is then used to check if the visible tiles.count is greater than zero, clearing it if so, before using a for each to cycle for every single tile key, checking if the name equals floor tile, calling floor map dot set tile if so, else if the tile name equals a wall tile, or then call obstacle map dot set tile otherwise, before calling setup fog map. Opening the UI manager, scroll down, we're going to be adding a new escape menu UI, so we're gonna add in a header attribute called escape menu y and a new boolean called is escape menu open, setting it to false by default, and a new game object called escape menu, providing the boolean its own getter before scrolling down. Here we're gonna create a new public void method called toggle escape menu. It works the same as the other toggle menus, but in our if statement, it uses our event system variables set selected game object, passing in our escape menu's child game object. Going to the toggle menu method, we're going to refactor all our if statements with a switch case. The switch case will go through every single menu boolean, checking which one is true, calling it in the process. Finally, going to just below toggle escape menu, we're going to add in three new methods 
save, load, and quit. However, with the load method, not only will call load game from the save manager, it will also call toggle menu. This is due to the fact that we don't want the menu open if we loaded the game while in a scene. Open the player script, and within the on exit method, we're going to add a new if statement that checks if the UI manager's is escape menu open is set to false, and if the UI manager's is menu open is set to false, calling its toggle escape method if so. And as we don't want two calls, we're going to set the if statement after to an else if. Opening new data back up, within the floor one scene, we're going to go ahead and expand the canvas game object, drag in the event system, before creating a new game object that's going to be centered in our canvas. Expand it just a bit. Set its color to black. Rename it to escape menu. We're going to give it a button child object. Remove the button's image. Call it, call it return to game. Setting its anchor to top. We're going to expand the button within the hierarchy. Rename the text to return to game. It's font asset to Roboto, selecting auto size. Make it bold and change the vertex color to white. Returning to the button, we're going to drag in our text game object into target graphic. Adding a new listener to the on click, dragging in our canvas. Clicking the drop down menu, we're going to hover over UI manager and select toggle menu. Duplicate it three more times, positioning it as you do. We now the first duplicate to load game. The second to save game. And the last to exit. Returning to load game, we're going to set in the drop down menu, instead of calling UI manager's toggle menu, we're going to instead call load. Repeat this process for the other buttons. Color them if you wish. Now selecting the canvas game object, we're going to scroll down and drag in the escape menu game object into our escape menu variable. Scroll up and selecting overrides, we're going to apply all. Making sure that escape menu is also turned off when doing so. Before proceeding to our main menu scene. All right, with our main menu open, we're going to go ahead and import whatever landscape image that you want to see to represent your main menu. I've opted for a nice dark background with a face, but you can generally do whatever you want. From there, we'll create a save manager game object, adding the component save manager. Next, we're going to create a new canvas, setting the render mode to camera, the UI scale mode to scale screen size, the reference resolution to 1920 by 1080, and height to one. Add the component main menu, and before we set the main menu's variables, we need to first create continue button. So first, we're going to create an image child object for the canvas. Name it background. Setting it to the image that you imported. If it's anchor to stretch. Create a new text mesh pro game object called title. You can position it however you want. And finally, a panel. I'll just call it menu panel. I'm gonna set the anchor to middle right. Now, within this panel, we're gonna create three buttons. The first being play a new game. The second continue last game. And the last quit. With our buttons created, we're going to add listeners to them. But plus, we're going to drag in the canvas object, select in the drop down menu. Hover over main menu and press new game. Continue for the rest. 
Now selecting canvas, we're going to drag in our event system into our event system variable for main menu and the continue button. Now, just before we click play, we're going to select event system and replace the import system and play. Our continue button has been disabled since there is no save. So we can go ahead and press play. And saving here. And loading. Now let's test it from the main menu. Our continue button is not disabled, so we can go ahead and click that. And it loads the game perfectly fine. We're learning how to traverse the dungeons, moving up and down floors. And to start, we're going to go ahead and import two new images, one called character information and the other level up. Links can be found down below in the description. Once they've been imported, we're going to open up our tile palette, expanding the Deja Vu sprite sheet. And we're going to import both the less than and greater than symbols. We'll be using them as our downstairs and upstairs. Lastly, opening up the scripts folder, we're going to navigate to the components folder and create the level. From here, we're going to head back into the entity folder, double clicking controls. We're going to add a new action called info, setting its binding to C. Now opening up the safe manager script, we're going to be implementing temporary saves as we want to move across floors without committing to anything. So in the save game parameters, we're going to add a boolean called temp save, setting it to true. Before adding an if statement, with this condition being temp save false, now moving into the load game method, we're going to cut out lines 78 to 86 creating a new method called load scene. This will be a public method that has a Boolean parameter called can remove player with it being set by default to true. And within we're going to paste that previously cut code. To fix our error, we're gonna go into the load state method, give it a parameter of Boolean can remove player and adding it to the game manager call. Heading over to the game manager script, we're gonna add in a new method called refresh player which just calls the player's update field of view method. Scrolling down to the save state, we're going to get rid of this if statement of entities.containsItem as it was producing a duplication bug. We're then going to, within the load state method, add in a new parameter of boolean can remove player, cutting out its if statement, leaving a new method called reset, passing in can remove player in its place, and also adding it to the load entity states. Scrolling just below the entity states, we're going to add in the reset method, which as you can predict, takes in a boolean, uses our if statement of entities.count is greater than zero, using a for each to go through every single entity within entities, which is an if statement to check if we can remove the player and if a certain entity has the player components, which simply uses continue if true, otherwise it destroys the entity game object. Once the loop is complete, it checks to see if the can remove player is true within an if statement, clearing both entities and actors. Otherwise, it simply removes every single entity or actor besides the player. Now within load entity states, we're going to add a new Boolean parameter called can place player. A new if statement within the if statement that checks if the entity state type is an actor, where if the entity name is player and the can place player Boolean is set to false, it will set the player's transform position to the entity state's position before refreshing the player and incrementing entity state before continuing. Within the else if statement, we're going to be checking that the item state's parent equals player and also checking if the can place player boolean is set to false, incrementing entity state if true before continuing. One last thing, heading on over to the top to on screen loaded, we're just going to add a true to the load state call. Now opening the map manager, we're going to add in two new tile base variables for our downstairs and upstairs, while also providing them getters. Now scrolling to on scene loaded, we're going to add a true boolean to the generate dungeon call, because heading to the generate dungeon method, we want to differentiate between a current game and a new game. So adding a new parameter boolean called is new game, which has a default or false, we're going to add that boolean to the generate dungeon proc gen call before creating a new if statement of not equal new game at the bottom. 
passing into it a game manager instance refresh player call one last step before we leave the generate dungeon method we're also going to add a new a new if and else statement if the if statement condition being floor map cell bounds size x is greater than zero which if true calls the reset method which scrolling down which is pretty self-explanatory it clears every single list and dictionary before clearing every single tile map of all their tiles heading back up and if it's false it just as usual instantiates rooms tiles and visible tiles one last thing heading to our load state method just like the generate dungeon method we're going to add the same if statement for adding a couple of else if statements checking for both our upstairs tiles and downstairs tiles now heading to rectangular room we're going to add in a new helper method called random point the random point method uses an arrow function to return a new vector to int which passes in a random dot range of x plus 1 inclusive and x plus width minus 1 exclusive for its x value and random dot range passing in y plus 1 for its inclusive and y plus height minus 1 for its exclusive for its y value. Now opening up procgen script we're going to add in the new boolean of is new game to its parameters before scrolling down, exchanging our entity creation for the player with the following. We're first going to set the downstairs tiles using a random point before getting a vector 3 int of player pause for creating a new local vector 3 int variable called player pause, which is set to a random point within the first room that's been hard casted with vector 3 int. We then use a while loop that uses the get actor allocation method passing in player pause, checking that it's not null. If there is an actor in that location, then it gives a player pause a new random point until the get act at location call returns null. We then set the upstairs tile using player pause before using an if statement checking if it's not a new game, which will set the player's position to the player pause position accounting for the tile. Else, it creates a new player passing the player pause. That's been hard casted with vector 2 int. All right, moving over to our level scripts, it's time to implement our code. We're going to add a required component type of actor attribute to the top of the class before adding in six int variables called current level setting to the default of one, current XP, XP to the next level, level up base with a default of 200, level up factor with a default of 150 and XP given. We're going to provide current level, current XP, XP to the next level and XP given with getters while also providing a setter for XP given. An on validate method will be used to set the, to the return of XP to the next level, a helper method that first multiplies the current level and level up factor before adding it to level up base. We next have a method called requires level up, which returns a boolean based on current XP greater than equal XP to the next level. The add XP method takes in an int parameter called XP, uses an if statement to check if XP is equal to zero, or level up base is equal to zero, returning true if so. If it isn't, it proceeds to add the XP to current XP, calling the add message method from our UI manager, before lastly using an if statement, if its condition being because level up is true, calling UI manager's toggle level up menu method, passing in the actor component. We'll get to this a bit later in the video, before finally the method calls UI manager's add message method to indicate that the player's advanced the level. We didn't have four more methods, the increase level method being private, which sets the current XP to zero, increments the current level, and sets XP to the next level variable to the return of experience to next level method. Increase max HP, increase power, and increase defense all have a parameter that takes in an amount, with the first being set to 20 by default, and the last two set to one by default. The amounts given are used to set the specific variables of each method. All three methods make use of the amount parameter to increment their specific variable before calling UI managers add message method before calling increase level. Finally, we implement both a save state method and a load state method, which both saves and loads the current level, the current XP, and the XP to the next level. Of course, both these methods be using a level state, the level state class containing three integers, current level, which is set to one, current XP, and XP to next level. All three variables have their own getters and setters, followed by a constructor. Now open the actor script as we want to support our new level components, starting with adding a new level variable, and again, instead of both the fighter and level variables, 
a new if statement to on the validate method for the level component, heading over to the active state class, add in a new level state variable, a getter and setter for it, followed by adding a new parameter to the constructor, and also adding a new line of this dot level state equals level state. Scroll up to save state. We're going to add level state is set to using a ternary level not equal null and get player is true, setting it to level dot save states return, else setting it to null. Before in the load state method, adding another if statement just like the fighter state, only for the level state, where it calls levels load state. Quickly heading over to the fighter script, we're going to add a new getter and setter for the max HP variable, followed by adding a setter to both defense and power. Then within the die method, we're going to add to the else statement gameManager.instance.actors, the index of zero, which is the player. We're going to get its level components before calling add experience, which passes in the level components xp given int variable, which is attached to the same game object as this fighter script. All right, heading on over to the UI manager script, we're going to be adding support for three new UI elements, which is our dungeon floor text, our character information, and our level up elements. So adding a new text menu pro u GUI variable, then we get dungeon floor text, we're going to head on down. And following the trend, we're going to add in a boolean to support our menus, followed by a game object. However, we're going to also add another game object for our level up menu, as we need to support its content. Add a getter for the character information menu, before once again scrolling down. We're going to add a helper method called set dungeon floor text. This will have a parameter of int floor. We will be setting the dungeon floor text dot text component to to dungeon floor colon using string interpolation. We'll be changing the start function to instead of using an arrow function, it's going to set dungeon floor text to the current floor within the save manager instance before using an if statement to check if the save manager's save dot save floor variable is zero, calling add message to welcome the adventurer to yet another dungeon, else it calls add message welcoming the player back. Moving on down, you will notice that all these toggle methods all have something in common, with is menu open being set to the active self of the menu and the menu's active state being set to the opposite of itself. So we're just gonna go ahead and implement a new method called set booleans. This will be a private method and will take in a game object of menu and a boolean of menu bool. Where well, the is menu open boolean is set to menu bool with menu's active state being set to menu bool. Just going to implement it in the toggle methods that out of the way, I'm just going to get rid of the if condition of is menu open before adding a new method called toggle level up menu. This method has an actor parameter called actor. It follows the trend of setting the boolean to the opposite of itself before calling set booleans, passing in its menu and the boolean itself. Three game objects, all consisting of the child game objects within our level up menu content. More on that soon. It gets all the components of the text message GUIs for those elements, getting their text. Before using string interpolation, it sets the text according to what child object it's on. With the constitution button being set to a constitution bracket plus 20 HP from then passing in actor.getComponentFighter max HP. The same process is continued for the next two buttons, but each using different variables. We then use a for each going through every child transform within the level up menu content dot transform, where we remove every listener within the child's button components. We then add a new listener based on the child game object itself, where if the constitution button variable equals the child dot game object, it adds the listener actor.getComponentLevel increase max HP before using else if statements going through the same process where if it's the strength button then it calls increased power or the agility button calling increased defense instead. As a safety we use an else statement to use debug.log error saying no button found. Finally it calls toggle level up menu passing an actor as we want the menu to close when a button has been selected. Lastly we use event system dot select a game object setting it to level up menu content. Moving on to our next method which is toggle character information menu, where it has a parameter of actor called actor with a default of num. It follows the same Boolean process 
before using an if statement checking if actor is not null before saying every child game object will be part of our character information menu UI game object we use an if statement to check actor is not null before setting every single child game object within our character information menu game object getting their text mesh pro UGUI components setting their text to the player's stats. The first game object being the level sets its text using string interpolation to level colon space actor.getComponent level getting its current level. The second XP going for the relative of the same process except it gets current XP instead. XP for the next level uses the XP to next level variable and the last two attack and defense gets the actor's fighter components power and defense. Heading to our save method due to our changes we're going to be setting this to false as if the save button is pressed, we want to inform the save manager that it's not a temporary save. We'll also add a call to add message that the world stops for a moment before doing the same for the load method. Scrolling up to toggle menu, we're going to add a new case for our character information menu before moving into the player script. Here, we'll be making a couple of slight changes where we're going to move the else if statement of target mode within our on exit method to the top. This is the correct the menu behavior issues within the game before moving to the onConfirm method where we're going to be adding an else if statement that checks the boolean return of can act before calling action not take stairs action passing in our actor components an action that we'll be taking a look at shortly we're then going to be adding a new method called on info which like the others has a parameter that takes in the input action dot callback context within it we use an if statement that checks context dot performed is true if so another if statement is used checking the return value for can act is true or ui managers is character information menu open is true which leads to calling ui managers toggle character information menu passing in an actor component if so opening the action script and importing uni engine dot scene management we're going to add in our new take stairs action method that we saw earlier, which has a parameter of actor called actor, where upon being called, it creates a vector three int called pos, setting it to the value provided by floor map dot will to cell, which we pass into the actor's transform position. It then creates a local string variable called tile name, which is set to return string provided by floor map dot get tile, passing in pos dot name. And if statement is then used to check if the tile name is not equal to either the upstairs tiles name or the downstairs tiles name, which if true, it calls UI managers add message method, saying that there are no stairs here before returning. Else, if there are stairs there, it then checks to see if the save manager's current floor equals to one and that the tile name equals the upstairs tiles name, which will call UI managers add message method again to notify the player that a mysterious force prevents them from going back before calling return. This is done because currently there's nothing implemented for a player to leave the dungeon. However, if both checks fail, it moves on to saving the player's instance, which we're using the temp save before incrementing or decrementing save manager's current floor by using a ternary to check if the tile name equals the upstairs tiles name, decrementing the current floor by one, else incrementing it. And if statement says then used to check if a scene exists within the save that equals the floor number, calling save managers load scene passing in false, else it calls game managers reset method passing in false before calling map managers generate dungeon method. We then send a call to UI managers add message before also calling its set dungeon floor text passing in save managers current floor. Now within the Unity editor, we're going to go into our resources folder, open up our canvas prefab, Within the canvas, we're going to create a new TextMess Pro object, call it Dungeon Floor. Set the default text, move it to the bottom left corner, just below our HP slider, and size it to your preference. Making sure to set the anchor to bottom left. Now we're going to be implementing the character information menu. So within the canvas, create a new image object, give it the source image of our character information menu. Move it to the top left, setting its anchor to the top left also, and just size it a little bit. Just going to name it character information within the hierarchy, and we're going to give it a text mesh pro text object. Name it level. We're going to set its anchor to top left. Auto size, style to Roboto, its character spacing to 30. We're just going to expand it to the right. We're making the text a bit smaller. Duplicate it four times before giving it a default text of level colon space one. 
Then the answer to the following, xb, giving a default text of xb colon zero, required xb, giving it the default text required xb colon zero, and repeating the same for the last two, which is attack and defense. Separate them from each other. And that's our character information menu done. Just go ahead and turn it off. Moving on, we're going to be adding in our level up menu game object. So if in the canvas, we're going to create a new image UI game object, name it level up menu, set its source image, and move it to the top right corner. Settings anchor the top right. Just going to stretch and size it to my tastes. Give it a child text object. It's text being, congratulations, you level up. Select an attribute to increase. Set the auto size. Spawn asset to Roboto. We're also going to give it a character spacing of 25 and a word spacing of 50, setting it to the middle alignment. Next, create a new game object within the level up menu. Call it level up content. Set it to stretch. It's left to zero, right to zero and just moving it ever so slightly down. Now give it a button child object within the content. We're going to remove the text child object within it, also removing its image, before adding a text mesh pro component to it. Set the target graphic to the text mesh pro by dragging in the component and set the anchor to top. Now adjust its position. And we're going to stretch it to the right. We'll then as usual set its bond asset to Roboto Select auto size, set its character spacing to 30, before duplicating it two other times. Adjust their positions, and rename them to constitution, strength, and agility. Selecting the constitution object, we're going to set its text to constitution plus 20 HP from 30. The strength object to strength plus one attack from five and the agility object to see agility plus one defense from two. We're going to make the buttons a bit more responsive by showing color changes depending on how the player interacts with the button. And with that done, we're going to close the level up menu component, setting its boolean to false, we've also making canvas, adding our dungeon floor game object to the dungeon floor text text mission GUI variable within our UI manager, Character information to character information menu UI. The same being done for level, both level up menu and level up menu content. Now selecting the orc player and troll prefabs, we're going to add a level component to them before selecting orc and setting its XP given variable to 30 with troll being set to 100. Now opening the scenes folder, we're going to open the dungeon scene, select map manager and set both the upstairs tile and downstairs tile. Upstairs being less than, and downstairs being greater than. Make sure to save the scene, proceed back to the main menu. Now pressing play, let's test out if everything works. Pressing C. Moving to the next level. Level up menu seems to work fine. And we're done. A big thank you to H Regal for being the first sponsor to help support my projects. Cheers for that. It's time to add in a sense of difficulty where as the player continues through the dungeon, more and more monsters will begin to spawn to defend their home and of course, loot. So we're gonna start by adding a utils folder within our scripts folder, opening it and creating a new script called random utils. Opening random utils, we're going to be removing their Unity engine import as well as our system.collections replacing of system instead. Add a static declaration to our class and remove extend modern behavior. We're going to replace the start and update methods with choice and choices. I won't go into detail, but what we're doing is we're working with the Python the choice function, a feature usually only available to Python. However, we've created a class extension to system.random to make use of it. The original source code can be found in Stack Overflow and it's attributed to Anon Coward. Link found both above and below in the description. Opening our procgen script, we're going to import both system and system.link, followed by also importing system.random and unity.random, giving them both aliases. 
with system not random being given sys random and unity engine not random being given unity random. Within the generate dungeon method, we're going to replace random with unity random. While also removing both max monsters per room and max items per room from the parameters. This is because we're going to be introducing four new lists. The first two being max items by floor and max monsters by floor. They'll both be a list of tuples with two ints, where the first int is the floor number and the second int being the amount of items or monsters. The last two are both the item chances and monster chances. However, their tuples, however, their tuple is the floor number, the name of the item or monster, followed by the weighted chance. We didn't have two helper methods get max value for floor and get entities at random with get max value for floor taking a list called values and also an int of floor and also an int called floor where we define a local int variable called current value giving it a default of zero we then use a for each to check every value in values using an if statement to check if floor is greater than equal value dot item one so the floor number it will set the current value variable to equal value dot item two so the second int value within the tuple Entities at random takes in a list called chances, an int called number of entities, and also an int called floor. It creates two local string variables, one being a string and the other an int, before initializing them. It then uses a for each to check every chance in chances, using an if statement to check that the floor is greater than equal chance.item1, so once again the floor number, using entities.addchance.item2, adding in a string value to entities, and weighted chances.addchance.item3, adding in the weighted chance value. Once the 4H is complete, we create a new instance of sysrandom for creating a new local list of string called chosen entities, where it's going to equal the return of random.choices, passing in entities, weighted chances, and number of entities before returning chosen entities. Going back to our generate dungeon method, within our place entities call, we're going to add to the end of it save manager.instance.current floor. Going to tunnel between, replace random with unity random. Before heading over to our place entities method, replace both int maximum monsters and int maximum items with int floor. Our local int variables number of monsters and number of items will replace with the following. So we're first renaming random to unity random, then within the range call, we're changing our explicit to use our new helper method get max value for floor, using both the max monsters by floor and max items by floor variables, passing our floor number plus one. We then replace the for loops with number of monsters and number of items, with three new list of string variables called monster names, item names, and entity names, with monster names and item names using the get entities at random method, passing in either monster chances or item chances, our local int variables number of monsters or number of items, followed by the floor number. Within the entity's names, it's set to monsters names concat item names to list, as we want to combine both the monster names and item names, before running it through a for each, where with every entity name and entity names, it gets a random point within a new room, making sure to hard cast it to vector 3 int, before using a while loop, calling game managers get act at location using entity pause checking if it's not null where if so it's going to constantly loop until it finds a position that is null before calling map managers create entity passing in both the entity name and entity pause hard casting it to vector 2 int finally opening up the map manager scripts we're going to remove both the max monsters per room and items per room variables scrolling down to generate dungeon and removing it from the proction.generate dungeon call now open the unity editor and press play You would notice that as you progress down into the depths of the dungeon, the loot drops will progressively get better and better, as on floor 1, we could only see a few orcs and only potions of healing. But now as I'm on floor 4, I can now pick up lightning scrolls and also fight trolls. And with that, we're done. For the final part of this tutorial, we're going to be implementing something that most roguelikes have, equipment. But before doing so, we're going to go to our resources folder, as we seem to have a large amount of clutter with our images mixing with our prefabs. So I'm going to go ahead and create an images folder and just drag every single image file onto it. From here, navigate to the components folder, create two new scripts, equipment and equipable, followed by a new folder called helpers, opening it and creating a script called equipment types. Opening it, we're going to place all the code for public enum to define our types. 
which for the time being would just be weapon and armor. Opening the equipable script, we're going to remove both the start and update methods, adding in three variables, equipment type being equipment type, and two int variables, power bonus and defense bonus, both having a default of zero. We're gonna provide them getters and setters, followed by giving the class a require component type of item attribute. As the equipable is also an item, just like the consumable, we're going to add a new equipable variable within our item class, followed by its getter. Opening the equipment script, we're going to start off by adding a required component type of actor attribute above the equipment class, followed by two variables, both equipable, called weapon and armor, followed by both their getters and setters. We're going to add two methods that return an int called defense bonus and power bonus, which both create a local int variable called bonus, giving a default of zero, where they use if statements to check that weapon and armor are not null, and if their defense bonus variable is greater than zero. If so, we use the addition assignment operator to add the defense bonus of either the weapon or armor to the local bonus variable before returning it. We then create a helper method called item is encrypted, which takes in an item and returns a boolean. The method itself uses an if statement to check that the item equipable variable is null, returning false if so. Otherwise it returns true if the equipable variable equals either the weapon or armor variable. We didn't have two helper methods called unequip message and equip message, which both taking a string of name, or more importantly takes in the equipable name, both calling the UI managers add message method. Moving on, we have the equip the slot method, which takes in a string called slots, an item, and a boolean of add message. We created a local equipable variable called item, which is the attorney operator to check if slot equals weapon, which sets it to weapon if true or armor if false. And if statement is then used to check if current item is not null, calling unequip from slots, passing in our slot variable and add message boolean, the unequip from slot method being a method that takes in both the slot and add message boolean, as you could tell, where it creates a local equipable variable called a current item, checking once again if slot equals weapon, setting to weapon if true and armor if false, it then sets the current item's name to current item that replace E with nothing using an if statement to check if the add boolean message is true, calling unequip message, passing the current item's name before once again checking if the slot equals weapon, setting weapon to null, else armor to null. Moving back to equip slot and where we left off, we use an if statement to check if the slot equals weapon, setting our weapon variable to the item's equipable variable, else the armor to the item's equipable variable, before using another if statement to check if add message is true, calling equip message, passing in the item's name. We then set the item's name using string interpolation, passing in the item name and ending it with a space E to let the player know that the item is equipped within the inventory. Finally, our last method within the equipment scripts is called toggle equipped, which takes in an item calling it equipable item and a boolean of add message with a default of true. It creates a local string variable called slots, which checks to see if the equipable item's equipable variable has an equipment type equal to equipment type dot weapon using the attorney operator, setting the string to weapon if true and armor if false. An if statement is then used calling item is equipped method, passing in the equipable item, where if true, it calls unequipped from slots, passing in both the local slot string and add message boolean. Else, it calls equipped to slot, passing in the slot variable, equipable item, and add message boolean. Opening the fighter scripts, we're going to rename both the defense and power variables along with their getters and setters due to the fact that we're now using equipment. Renaming defense to base defense and power to base power. And then within our max HP setter, we're going to change it so once it sets the max HP value, it's then going to use an if statement to check if there's a player component before calling UI managers set health max method passing in the max HP value. That done, we're going to add four new helper methods with them being called power, defense, defense bonus, and power bonus. They each return an int variable. The power and defense methods return the base power or base defense plus their respective bonus method, which could be either defense bonus or power bonus. The defense bonus method checks to see if the equipment component is not null before returning the defense bonus call made using the equipment component, else it returns a zero. The power bonus method working much the same way, with it using an if statement to check if the equipment component is not null before returning its power bonus call, else returning zero. Opening the actor script, we're going to implement a new equipment variable, its getter, followed by an on call. 
opening a level script, we're going to replace get component actor.fighter with just a get component fighter, and then change power to base power and defense to base defense as we rename the variables within the fighter script. Now we need to work on some safe support. So opening the game manager, navigate down to load entity states. We're going to bring the local string entity name variable within the first if statement, followed by creating a new local string variable called entity name within our else if statement, where upon load, we're using attorney operator. It's going to check if the entity state.name contains an E within parentheses, replacing the E with nothing if true, otherwise we're just returning a name of false. Opening the item script, we're going to add another if statement, but this time within the state.parent if statement within our load state, which checks to see if the equipable variable is not null and that the state.name contains an E within parentheses. Calling the parent game object's equipment equip the slot method, passing in both the equipable dot equipment types string, the item, and false for the add message boolean. Now, even though we supported our equipable items, there's not much point without having an actual action to equip them. So heading over to the action script and firstly correcting our melee action method, where we're just gonna add preferences to our power and defense before scrolling down and adding a new method called equip action, which takes in both an actor and item. It uses an if statement to check if the item equipable variable is null, whereupon it calls UI manager's add message method, informing the player that the item cannot be equipped before returning. Otherwise, it calls actor equipment's toggle equipment method, passing in the item, before calling UI manager's toggle inventory method before ending the turn. We're gonna make some slight corrections. So navigating to the drop action method, we're going to add an if statement, which checks to see if the item variable is equipped by calling actor's equipment variables item is equipped method, passing in the item, where if the item is equipped, it calls the actor equipment's variables toggle equipped method passing said item before continuing. Within the use action method, we're going to replace the first if statement's condition with item.consumable is not null. This is due to item having both the, the consumable variable and equipable variable. And we don't want the item to call the consumable variables activate method as there wouldn't be a consumable in the first place. Due to the numerous changes that we've made, we have to tweak the UI manager a little bit. So within the toggle level up menu method, we're going to add parentheses to both power and defense before heading over to the toggle character information menu doing the same. And as we do have an equipped action, we want to add a bit of support to that as well within the update menu method, where now we check to see if the item consumable is not null using an if statement, whereupon it would add the action dot use action listener. Else if the item's equipable variable is not null, it would add a listener of action dot equip action. It's high time we added some equipables. So within the components folder, we're going to create a new folder called equipables, opening it. And we want to create four new scripts called Dagger, Sword, Leather Armor, and Chain Mail. These are relatively simple scripts where they all inherit equipable and are sealed classes. They each have a constructor referencing their specific equipment type, followed by either a power bonus or defense bonus. They also use an onValidate method to set the parent components, equipment weapon or armor to it. Open the Uni Editor back up. We're going to create a prefab for each of the new scripts. And we can start by first duplicating the Potion of Healing, removing the Healing script, and duplicating it three more times. We're going to rename each of them after a script. And starting with Dagger, we're going to change its sprite image to a forward slash, its color to teal, followed by adding in the Dagger component, setting items equipable variable to it. Do this for the rest, setting their colors to whatever you'd like. With the last leather armor and chainmail, we're going to select them both and set their sprites to a left square bracket. Before we move on to setting both the base power and base defense variables as we renamed them earlier. So selecting the play prefab, we're going to set the base defense to one and base power to two. The orc prefab gets a base power of three with its defense remaining zero, while the troll gets a base defense of one and a base power of four. Finally, selecting the troll, player and orc, we're going to add the equipment component. Now you probably noticed that the player doesn't really have that much defense or power. So let's go ahead and change that by opening the proc gen script. First, we're going to add two new tuples to the item chances list, where the fourth floor will get a sword and the sixth floor will get chain mail. Moving down to the generate dungeon method and to where the player is created, 
We're going to make use of the else statement where instead of just creating the player, it's going to create the player and then set it to a local player game object variable. We're using that variable we're going to get the player's actor component before creating two item variables called starter weapon and starter armor. The entities being both a dagger and leather armor. We then proceed to add both these items to the player inventory using the inventory's add method. Before using the player actor.equipment.equip the slots method, first passing in the weapon before passing in the armor. Before we use the equipment components equip the slot methods, passing in our starter weapon and our starter armor, respectively. Now pressing play. Our unequipped and equipped works. And just switching to the chain mail. Our leather armor unequipped successfully, and the chain mail is put on with their text changing accordingly. And yeah, that's it. That's the end of the tutorial. Uh, cheers for following along. I hope you learned a lot. As I can tell you, I certainly did. I may or may not introduce new pull requests on the repository. If you are following the roguelike dev does the complete roguelike tutorial challenge, congratulations, you've made it to the end and I hope you're all the best. Feel free to either tweet me, reach out to me on Discord. Otherwise, if you need a bit more inspiration, you want to know what else you can do roguelike wise, be sure to check out the roguelike development subreddit. I'll leave a link down below and yeah, best of luck. Be sure to like the video if you enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel if you haven't and comment if you have any questions. Cheers. Take care.